Let's discuss this issue of inequality and economic hardship with our panel of guests. With me is John, uh, I'm not saying it right, Kavanaugh, Kavanaugh. Ah, ah, there we go, Kavana and Lou Lane. You guys need to have easier names. <laughs> and Lou Lane, uh, Lane Bigelow, Lou Lane Bigelow. Oh, okay, we're off to a great start. <laughs> um, okay, first, I want to talk about the child tax credit because this went up during COVID, and um, it, it, what happened? What did it do, Lou Lane? And what 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 was the result? So it was expanded to um, cover more families and to give put. Um, cash into people's hands. That was a big, you know, that's actually a central piece of what I think Democrats and uh, Republicans are arguing about the child tax credit right now. It's refundability. So a lot of people who are experiencing poverty don't pay any taxes. And so if you give them a tax credit, it really doesn't help them unless you give them the, um, unless you make it refundable. And you know, getting cash into their hands gives them the opportunity to pay for diapers if that's what they need, to fix their car if that's what they're looking to do, or to um, get um, caught up in rent uh, if that's if that's what is facing them right now. I want to get into the issue of poverty because I think it's also the way the government cr calculates poverty is not a it does not get a snapshot. 65% of people say they're living paycheck to paycheck. Right. That does not match these numbers. I mean, the poverty rate in the United States, just for our audience to understand, for a family of three, the government only believes you're in poverty if you make about $24,000. So how big is this issue, John? Yeah, well, so I think people in other countries think we have poverty, but, and they've seen photos of homeless people, and they think it's a problem, but a small problem. As you just pointed out, the majority of Americans are hurting. They're finding it hard to get by on their paychecks. We do work with the Poor People's Campaign, and we did a careful look into how many people are poor and low wealth, meaning that if they got a $300 medical expense, they would be underwater. They wouldn't be able to pay for food or rent. And we found that four out of 10, so two-fifths of Americans, are in that situation. They're poor and low wealth. Most of them have no assets either. They don't have a house, they don't have a car. And so for them, what things cost, be it their food or their rent or their gas, is the difference between their children being able to eat a good balanced meal and not. I know this is a really tough question to ask, but that's why I'm here. To both of you, we are the richest country in the world. We have enormous amounts of wealth. Why are so many people poor? First to you. Um, it's a policy choice. We are governing, making policy decisions to give tax credits you know, to the rich or to corporations instead of actually helping people who are experiencing poverty. And I think we're seeing it, we're, we heard it in the segment earlier where you hear voters are disenchanted with politics and government. And that is because of rising in income inequality. And that's why they're also open to things like authoritarianism and why democracy is you know, feeling like it's a little bit more brittle now, because those things go hand in hand, where income inequality and, um, and democracy declining. Yeah, just picking up on that, it's partly what I would even use a harsher term. It's policy violence that keeps four out of 10 people living on the edge. But in addition to it, as Lelaine said, this country, the richest, as you pointed out, in the planet, is also the most unequal. So at the top, we have billionaires. We have huge corporations that have a lot of concentrated power. They, too, now they come out of the policy violence. Trump pushed policies that made billionaires richer. But as a result, right now, why are prices rising? It's because a small number of companies own there's three meatpacker company, companies that own all of the meatpacking. 82%. 82%, yes, <laughs> beautiful. You, in each sector, you have that kind of extreme concentration. They are setting the prices. They are pay, they're making huge profits. They're paying their CEOs tens of millions of dollars, and they are the core. I mean, the people in the policy world call this price gouging, mm -hmm. and one of the parties wants to get rid of it and another doesn't. The, the thing that is the biggest crisis right now that people are talking about is housing. And on housing, at the top, you have billionaires from both the U.S. and overseas that have come in, bought up luxury housing, squeezing out low-income housing. You have a big, big billionaire like Steve Schwartzman, who's the CEO of Blackstone. He owns hundreds of thousands of housing units. He made $120 million last year, and he is 
making profits off of pushing up rents to levels that are simply unsustainable. In this so let's talk about the candidates real quickly. We don't have a lot of time. Lulene, what would Donald Trump do for the poorest Americans? Well, I, in his policies, I don't see it making a huge difference, um, particularly because he's very focused on things like tariffs, which don't um, individually help people. Actually hurt people. Yes, and um, continuing his tax cuts, which, is, again, are focused on corporations and the wealthy. When you see Kamala Harris's sheet platform, her her platform really fundamentally can um, restructure our economy. It's focused on care, which we've never done that before, like other countries, supporting um, people with uh, a child, um, child care, paid family and medical leave. This will actually help people on an individual level. And you'll see them, I think, um, you'll see our economy make huge changes because this really affects women who's, you know, half of our population. And right now they're struggling. But John, does Harris go far enough for poverty? She talks a lot about the middle class, but does she right. talk about poverty enough? Well, neither <coughs> candidate has talked about the problem we're talking about here. And they are allergic to the word poor or low wealth. Middle class is the, is the key word. Her policies go in the right direction. She would build a lot more homes. She would go after price gougers. But the deep structural issues, we've got to deal with the inequality that we were just talking about if we really want to help poor and low-wage people. We need to tax billionaires. We need to rein in the corporations that are, that are gouging people. I think popular movements in this country are so upset that they will, as they push Joe Biden to do much more than was his natural inclination, I believe they would do the same with the Harris administration. Well, then let's also talk about the racial dimension of this, because for black families make 23 cents for every $1 wealth that a white family has. For Hispanics, it's 19 cents. Yes. So how can the candidates get in, how can they address that specific portion? I mean, because they, although there is this misconception in the country that the majority of poor people are minorities, they're not. The majority right. of poor people in America are white. But how can they address the, wa the racial gap? So. I I think her policies do address those things. So when you when you think about who has the most student loan debt in this country, it is black women. And when you look at um, who takes on the proportion of caregiving, it is typically black women, Latina women as well. So those policies, the way that they are couching them aren't necessarily in those terms, but they are crafted and, and vetted and researched in a way that I think will address the concerns of the of people of color and women of color. This was such a smart discussion. I thank you both for joining us here on Al Jazeera. So